wondered what a Pentecostal believes or even what a Pentecostal is. I know you may have clicked on this and you're like, I don't even know what, what a Pentecostal is. Well, you've come to the right place. Um, we've, we've started the study on why I'm not, and we believe it's so important to study out things to, to figure out what truth is because we have all these different beliefs out in the world. We have all these different religions and realizing what truth is. There's, there is not a your truth and my truth. There is, there is one truth, there's God's truth, and that's what we're, we want to f- aim to figure out. And so we're, we've been studying these things, why I'm not a Muslim, why I'm not a, a Catholic Baptist. I know you probably saw that. That was kind of a crazy, uh, a crazy title there. But today we want to hit on why I'm not a Pentecostal. And you say, okay, well, what is that? Well, you see it even in the name, Pentecost. And it goes back to Acts chapter number two, which we're going to kind of get into um, but when it comes to Pentecostals, they, they're not like other religions in the sense that, you know, other religions, they have the Bible and the Quran. They have, or Mormons have the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and, and the Catholics have the Bible and traditions and all these other different um, councils. Um, we believe that the Bible is the, the only word of God. It's the, the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. That's the only thing we use. And that's what Calvinists, and that's what uh, Pentecostals believe as well, but it doesn't come down to what different things that we use as far as truth goes. It comes down to the interpretation of the said truth, and that's where we kind of differ when it comes to uh, these things as a matter of interpretation, and it comes down to rightly dividing when we get down to it. Uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians ten thirty two, you have three different groups of people. You have the Jews, you have the Gentiles, and you have the Church of God. And I think when studying your Bible, when reading different passages of Scripture, the most important thing is to like figure out, okay, why is this passage written? Who is it written to? What is this even for? Um, Because a lot of times we have people who look in passages of Scripture, chapters in the Bible, and they say, oh, well, this sounds good. This must be applied to me, and we take it. Um, I know a lot of preachers who have preached out of Malachi chapter number 3, and they talk about you need to give to the Lord, and if you don't give to the Lord, you'll be cursed, you'll have a flat tire. All these different things will happen to you if you don't give. Well, that's talking to the Jewish people, and you, there was a specific reason why they tithed, and it, they didn't even tithe money a lot of times. A lot of times it was food, and there, there was just these different things, and, and it was for a different time, but yet we like to apply that for us. Well, nowadays... That when Paul was talking, written, writing to the church, it's about giving. You know, it's about a cheerful heart. It's not of of necessity. It's not of grudgingly. It's about hey, purpose in your own heart what you want to give. And so that's written to the church. So you got to realize, okay, who is God writing to? What is this for? And and that's the thing that we've come to when it comes to Pentecostals is passages that they've taken. These are Jewish passages that they're that they're reading. Um, they're written to the Jewish people and for different purposes of why these things are done that we're going to kind of talk about today. But, you know, me and Brother James are talking. Now, he's off camera uh, because he's controlling the soundboard of different things. But we were talking about the different beliefs that Pentecostals have. You know, they they believe differently about, okay, what tongues are. They believe differently about what apostles are. And we're going to get into all this, all these things today. But they believe differently about what being filled in the, with the Spirit is. Now, I know we view that differently, but what do Pentecostals believe being filled with the Spirit is? Yeah, I think, I think one thing that's important is the text explains itself. Right. And when, when we go to Matthew 3, if you go to Matthew 3 in verse 11, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. See, what's interesting here is those uh, Pentecostals will take this as as a verse that that's a, it's a positive thing right. to be baptized by fire. Right. But the plain text, if you continue reading, will show you that that's not so whose fan is in his hand, mm. and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Mm. So we see what that fire, that baptism of fire is, and that, that's, a, that's a coming judgment baptism right. that's going to be happening here. 
but the, they'll take that verse and they'll say, well, well, the Holy Ghost moving on me, on me and it causes me to to move and do these things like speaking in tongues, right. like these miracles that happen at Pentecost. Right. And so that's that's what they're taking that baptism to be. But but what we we see here in these verses is obviously there's a baptism with water, but there's a there's coming one that's what's greater which uh, Paul will even eventually um, go back with the baptism that Cornelius and look back on that and saying, wow, th- the Holy Spirit moved on him. Right. And this is something that, that now that, that is a sign to the Jews that now they're, they're seeing that the Gentiles are getting in on this thing. Right. And, and, and that's a great truth. So, so there's the water baptism, there's the spiritual baptism, which places a person into Christ, but then there's this fire baptism, right. which the Pentecost will take as as being a movement of the Holy Ghost. But really, honestly, when you read the text, it's a coming judgment, right? So, so then we have to look: what is being filled with the with the Spirit, right? And I think I think a good verse uh, for us to really rest in is just what the Bible says: being filled with the Spirit, is. right? If we look at uh, um, in in Ephesians. Chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And it's very interesting that he says this, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's there's so, there's something about being filled with the spirit and then meditating on scriptural type mm-hmm. things the these psalms and these hymns that right. are part of scripture right um and or even based off of scripture right right and then but but the the reason why I'm saying that is when we look at Colossians three which is a sister verse to to this in Colossians three it's going to say something very similar in Colossians three. It's in verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So as opposed to being filled with the wor- right. with the Spirit, what it says is being dwelled with, with the word of God. Right. So what we're seeing here, and then it'll go on teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and mm. spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart. To the Lord. Now we're seeing that these two things are exactly related. Right. Being filled with the Spirit is being filled with the Word of God, hmm. and so being sp- uh, being spiritually led is being spiritually obedient to the Word of God. And so hmm. th- that's what actually being filled with the Spirit is is actually being obedient to God's Word, a, a, a yielding to right. God's Word. Right. So it's not a, and, and I love how you explained it. It's it's not a you know, what Pentecostals believe is, okay, we're baptized with the Spirit, um, but we're also baptized with fire, which obviously he makes the distinction there between, okay, the Holy Ghost and fire over here yeah. and describes what that is. So those who do not get baptized with the Spirit, which you get saved, you're going to be baptized with fire one day, mm-hmm. because which is not a baptism I would want to be involved in. But you're, you're, it's one or the other. It's not you get baptized with the Spirit and like you're like fire too. Um, which they believe if you get baptized with the Spirit, then you have this, the, you're baptized with fire too. So then a result of then being baptized with the Spirit is speaking in tongues and all these different things. Yeah, and that's why that one thing that's important is is to them, now these signs are a portion, that they're strictly tied to your salvation right? and the way that the Holy Spirit's moving in your life. Right. Now when these things are not happening in your life, now you start to question your salvation even. Right. And that's another thing, too, that um, that th- one of the things that they believe. Now, now, the things that I mentioned, like or what we mentioned, not every single Pentecostal believes every single thing. Now, we don't want to categorize like you, you, someone leaves us and say, oh, he said we believe this. I don't believe that. Well, so not all Pentecostals believe that you can lose your salvation. And, you know, not all Pentecostals believe certain things that maybe we say, but a lot of them do. And a lot of them believe, okay, well, if you're not showing signs of being filled with the Spirit, then you must not have the Spirit um, anymore, which that's something that we also don't believe as well. We don't believe that you can lose your salvation. We believe that Jesus Christ seals you to the day of redemption and, and, and you know, 
that's a blessing in and of itself. But is there anything else you wanted to add when it comes to um, just being anything that they believe or anything like that? No, I, I just think um, we just need to interpret Scripture by right. letting ex- Scripture interpret its own self. Right. And that's going to lead to w- what you're going to talk about is tongues as well. Right. Well, thank thank you so much for, uh, and if you're, if you're watching the video, you can clap for Brother James. But thank you so much for, for just sharing that with us, just sharing that different perspective and rightly dividing is so important. First Corinthians ten thirty two. I'd already mentioned it. Realizing who these passages are written for, uh, but also asking, okay, what is tongues? Why was tongues even used? And when you look back to the very first mention of tongues in the Bible, uh, Genesis chapter number ten, um, you see that the first mention principle. When something's mentioned for the very first time, it's usually defines that way the rest of the time in Scripture. And when you see it in Genesis chapter number 10 in verse number 5 and verse number 20, it's referring to a language. And when you when you look at tongues in the Bible, that's all it is. And it's a physical language, not a spiritual one. Uh, I know a lot of people try to use Romans chapter number 8, verse number 26, where it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So a lot of people say, okay, we don't know what to pray. So the spirit speaks through us and starts uttering things. But a lot of times we don't pay attention to the rest of the verse. It says, but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us. So the spirit's praying for us with groaning groanings, which cannot be uttered. You know, we think when the spirit's praying through us, you know, from a Pentecostal view, we're speaking out in tongues. It's a heavenly language. But in reality, it says with utterings that cannot groanings that cannot be uttered. So there's nothing even being spoken at all. There's just a spirit's praying for you because he knows what you need. Um, so what we see here is tongues. It's a physical language, uh, but it's not a spiritual one. It's not like it's a there's a special thing going on between me and God that only he can understand. It's you know it's not gibberish. It's a language in Scripture. Um, it it would be like for instance if someone comes up speaking Spanish. Okay, they're speaking another tongue. They're speaking another language. And even though I can't understand them, that, that's why when you see the passages, unknown tongue, oh yeah, it's unknown. It's unknown to me. I don't know how to speak Spanish. So that's another, that's another language. That's another tongue. And that's what tongues is. Um, but why were tongues given? Well, step number one, to warn unbelieving Jews to warn unbelieving Jews. When you look in the passages throughout the book of Acts, it's only like three chapters in Acts. And in like it's mentioned in First Corinthians as well, when tongues are mentioned, they're always to Jews and they're always to unbelieving Jews. You see, Jesus, when he started his ministry, he said, don't go to the Gentiles, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, they rejected. And so he starts making his way to the Gentiles and acts as a transitional book. You see that at the beginning, he's dealing with Jews. Then he starts dealing with Gentiles. And by the end of it, he's dealing only with Gentiles. Now he's dealing with the church of God. And as he's transitioning these things, he's showing these signs to these unbelieving Jews that, hey, I'm starting to save these Gentiles. I'm starting to work with these Gentiles. And all these tongues and all these signs and these healings, all these things were signs to show, hey, I'm working with the Gentile people. And because Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. And so he had to show these things to confirm what he said and how he's starting to move with the Gentile people because they rejected. Uh, but when you see in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 21 and 22, it says, In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Verse 22 in, in chapter 14 says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. You know, when you when you get together in a Pentecostal church, you normally have believers that get together and they're all speaking in tongues. They're all doing all these things. But we see here that tongues are not for believers. Tongues are for assigned to them that believe not. And so when when you're getting together in a group of believers, I know I, one time I went to a Pentecostal church and not all of them are the same. But I went to this one uh, because I was, you know, chasing a pretty girl, and I got there, and you know, instantly they all get together in this group, and they all start speaking in tongues, like slowly, and then next thing you know, it erupts. Everybody speaking in tongues. There was like 20, 30 of them speaking in tongues. So people start falling in the floor, and I was like, I, I have to, I have to get out of here. It just, just was a weird feeling. And uh, what, what's kind of crazy, you know, my mom had a nightmare that night of just about everything that was going on with me at the church. 
and she's not had a nightmare before or since then. And she's like, Mike, hey, you're not going back because <laughs> it was just a lot of kind of crazy stuff going on. But they were not speaking in tongues to reach the unbelievers that were in the crowd. They were speaking in tongues just because they thought, okay, this is just something we're supposed to do. But that's the reason why tongues are giving is a sign to the unbelieving Jews that were there to speak in their own language. Um, you see that at Pentecost. You know, that's that's the way they, they believe that that's the way the church is supposed to be today is like Pentecost in Acts chapter number two with the speaking in tongues and different things like that. But what you see in Acts chapter number two, and I know this is a lot of information, so stick with me. What you see in Acts chapter number two is Jews had come to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost from all 16 areas of the ancient world. So you have all these different kinds of Jews coming with their own dialect, their own language, and they come to, and when they're hearing the word of God, the apostles are speaking, they speak the word of God. And what God does, this is the miracle now. God speaks to every single one of those groups of Jews in their own language, the word of God. And that was the amazing thing is that, okay, you have, let's just say you had, um, uh, you had a Spanish people show up and you had uh, Asian people show up and you have all these different groups of people show up. And as I'm speaking the word of God, God uses what I'm saying and makes it known. And it's like a translator, if you will, to different people. It, God uses that what I'm saying, the word of God and translates it in their own language to those people. That's what speaking in tongues was. It's not like gibberish. It's not like a, a la, 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 you know, like that, which I'm not trying to make fun, but it's a language and speaking to those people in their own language, in, in which brought 3,000 of them to true repentance in Acts chapter number two. Um, in Acts chapter number 10, another um, sp a story of the speaking in tongues, one of like three in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter number 10, the gift of tongues was used in Cornelius. He was a Gentile. But it was to convince the Jewish Christians that God would save believing Gentiles uh, because the Jews did not believe did not believe that. So he used the tongues for a, for a sign to show those believing those Christian Jews that we're speaking and we're saving Gentiles now. So that's what it was. Every single time tongues are mentioned and you can look it up. I pro I, I, I wish you would look it up um, because don't just trust what people say you know, show in scripture. Every time it's used, it's to unbelieving Jews. That was step number one. Number two is to confirm the New Testament word from God by signs. Uh, when you see Mark 16, 17 through 20, all the signs that these apostles had, which this is a kind of a question of, okay, is there apostles today? Well, here was the qualifications for an apostle. Sign number one, cast out devils. Sign number two, speak with new tongues. Sign number three, take up serpents. Sign number four is drink any deadly thing and it will not hurt you. So sign number five, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I well, I would, I would, I would love to get a group of apostles together and I would love to go through these qualifications to see if they pass. Give, give them a serpent and let them handle a serpent. Give them a uh, poison, have them drink the poison. We all watch them and they not die. Nothing bad happens to them because they're an apostle. These are qualifications for, for an apostle, none of these things would hurt them. And that's what being an apostle is. An apostle today, they're like, I'm just going to heal people. I, I am an apostle. But they're, they're not apostle. There's no apostles today because they don't have the signs of an apostle. These are things that God used to confirm that these were apostles. But we don't see that today. We see someone uh, knocking someone out, um, uh, so-called healing at different healing things. But I think a lot of times it's just bad breath that knocks people out. Um, but not really at all God using that person to actually to, to do this. So that this is the test of the apostles um, and qualifications of the apostles. But um, let's see here. And that was to show that they were qualified to be an apostle and to speak in these ways and to do these things that God um, would have done. The Bible says that God confirmed these signs by men. 2 Corinthians 12, 12, when it speaks of the apostles, it speaks in the past tense. And it even says in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, that tongues would cease. And so we see that this is something that God used to establish things, but it's not something that God is using today because why? We have a sure word of prophecy. We have something that God speaks to us in his word. And the apostles were uh, setting the apostles doctrine, the foundation, and they were doing these things to transition and God was using them, but we don't have any more apostles today. Um, or we would see the confirmation of these signs of these apostles, these qualifications. So, so, so we see that tongues was used to warn unbelieving Jews um, to, to, 
to unbelieving, not people that believe, but people that believe not, to confirm the New Testament word of God by signs, but to also to confirm the apostles as God's true messengers. You see that in Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. But something I want to mention to you, and, I, and I'm about to wrap up, there's no mentions of tongues can be found in Paul's later epistles, only in 1 Corinthians, which is one of Paul's earliest writings, which will kind of overlap with the book of Acts in that time frame. So it's one of the earliest writings. When Paul mentions how to walk, like your spiritual walk in Ephesians 4 through 6, he never mentions tongues. Even when he mentions qualifications for pastors and deacons and all these things, if, if tongues were that important, he never mentions it in the qualifications for a pastor or a deacon. There, it's never mentioned. Uh, every single time tongues are mentioned, it is for Jews alone. Uh, I, I want to examine one last thing as we kind of wrap this thing up today. I want to kind of look at 1 Corinthians 14. And when you examine 1 Corinthians 14, we see that the tongues are three things. Number one, tongues are a language. You see that in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 27 through 28. It's a physical language. It's not a spiritual one. But number two, it's for lost people. 1 Corinthians 14, 22, we see that where tongues were for a sign, for the, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But number three, we also see that tongues in 1 Corinthians 14 is less preferred of the gifts. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number five, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but that rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that what the church may receive edify. You know, a lot of times what we think speaking tongues were for edifying. They were supposed to reach people. But tongues today in our churches, it's a lot of like gibberish. It's a lot of p things that people can't understand. But Paul said, I would rather you prophesy. This is a less preferred gift. I, I would rather someone prophesy. So we see it's a language. It's for lost people. It's for less. Pre it's less preferred. But what is the qualifications for tongue speaking? Well, we see first off in number verse number 27 in 1 Corinthians 14, only two to three people, three people at the most, can speak in tongues at one time. What, read with me in verse number 27. And I would highly encourage, please read through 1 Corinthians 14. It says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. So course means to be in order. So it's not like everybody's doing it at one time where you can't hardly understand. Um, and it says, let one interpret. So number one, only two to three people at the most can do it at one time. So you, not normally when you go to places, everybody's doing it at the same time. But also you need an interpreter. First number 27, verse number 28. Verse number 28 says, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So if there's no interpreter, a lot of times when you go into churches, and that's a question I would ask you, if all these people are speaking gibberish and nobody knows at all what they're saying, nobody, there's not an interpreter present, then that's not speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is a, is a language, a physical language. So that's the step number one is there can only be a maximum amount of three people doing it at one time. Number two, you need an interpreter. People have to understand what you're saying. It has to be like an actual language. Like if someone came in and, and they speak Spanish and they don't speak English like you do, and you're speaking Spanish to, to reach this people, yeah, that's speaking in tongues. It's not a gibberish language. But we also see step number three, only men can speak in tongues. Verse number 34, you see, in the context of speaking in tongues, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So when you go to a lot of Pentecostal churches, the majority of the time, it's the women that are speaking in tongues. I know for personally, the one that I went to, it was like all women that were speaking in tongues. Well, we see here only a maximum of three people. You need an interpreter. So you get, people have to know what you're saying. Someone does. Number three, only men can speak in tongues. That's in the context of speaking tongues is, is women cannot speak in the church. And then number four, the reason is for unbelieving Jews as a sign. And it says in 1 Corinthians one twenty two that Jews require a sign. And so we see here what speaking in tongues is. It's a language. It's a physical language. If someone comes in speaking Spanish, they're speaking another tongue. They're speaking another language that we can understand. Um, but you need an interpreter. It's not just gibberish. That's the common thing that we see nowadays. Um, and when only men can speak in tongues, and when you when you look at the context of 1 Corinthians 14, 
And we see what being filled with the Spirit is. Brother James touched on that, all these different things. But questions I would kind of ask you to kind of end on this is just a couple questions. Number one, do you use your tongue as a warning to Jews to repent? What do you use tongues for? Is it just to just to do tongues or is there actually a purpose behind it? There should be a reason to reach unbelieving. Uh, number two, does someone stand by and interpret what is being said at your church? These are just questions to ask yourself. Do women speak in tongues at your church? Number four, does only a maximum of three people speak in tongues at one time in your church? And these are things, these are guidelines that God has established. Paul has written that God said when it comes to speaking in tongues, when it comes to apostles. We saw um, the, the qualifications for apostles and what those were, and God confirmed through them what they would what they would be doing. So that's why I kind of wanted to lay out. This is why I am not a Pentecostal, just because of context of Scripture, what this was for, what tongues actually are. It's not a holy spiritual language that we're trying to talk to God. It's a physical language. And being filled with the Spirit is being filled with the Word of God. It's not being filled with the baptism of fire where we're speaking gibberish. Um, and so an apostle obviously has qualifications behind it. So these are kind of some things that we wanted to, to look through today. Hopefully they were a help to you. Um, and as we continue to study, I know we're going to kind of dive into more why I'm not an atheist, different things like that, but we just kind of wanted to go examine through scripture and just kind of look at this today. So thank you so much for brother James for, um, for joining me today. And we hope this was a help to you. Please share this with other people. Hopefully this is a help to you as you further your studies. And we look forward to joining back with you here in the near future. Thank you guys. <music>